Number 1. This first case is so disturbingly bizarre, it could be the plot for the next series of True Detective. The year was 1989. Spring break was in full swing, and 21-year-old Mark Kilroy intended to take full advantage of it. He was pre-med at the University of Texas, and in his mind, a wild time south of the border was just what the doctor ordered to unwind and recharge. Mark gathered three of his closest friends, and the group parked their car in Brownsville. They then walked across the bridge over the Rio Grande to Matamoros, the Mexican border town. This was common practice for young people in the area. Thousands of American students make the same trip each year. Matamoros was, and still is known for being a spring break haven. As you can imagine, the four young men partied on the beach well into the night. But even the best of nights have to come to an end, and Mark and his friends decided it was time to head back across the border over the bridge. Problem was, a whole bunch of other partygoers had the exact same idea. The bridge was massively crowded. In the shambolic chaos of crossing back over, Mark became separated from his friends. No big deal, they figured. They'd just meet back up on the other side of the border. Well, that's the thing. Mark never made it to the other side. When the next morning rolled around and he still hadn't turned up, his friends called the police. He was immediately registered as a missing person. So, where had he vanished to? It perplexed both his friends and the police. The guy had a good head on his shoulders, it's not like he couldn't have found his way back to Brownsville. Had Mark decided to start a new life in Mexico? Or had something more nefarious happened to him? For over a month, his whereabouts remained a mystery. The initial investigation turned up next to nothing. There was no CCTV footage of Mark, no witnesses, no anything. The police were starting at a dead end. As fate would have it though, an invaluable lead happened to stumble right into their hands. On April Fool's Day, over a month since Mark had first disappeared, a man called Serafin Hernandez Garcia unwittingly led police right to a place called Rancho Santa Elena. They suspected he was a lackey for a drug gang and wanted to shut down their narcotics operation. They had no idea he had information about Mark. When the cops busted the gang at the ranch, one of the crew said that they'd seen a gringo tied up in the back of a truck a few weeks back said that he didn't know what happened to him. That's when Seraphim made a confession. With a strange degree of calmness, he told the cops that the young gringo was dead. He had helped to kidnap and murder him. Though initially startled by this unexpected confession, it didn't take the police long to realize who Seraphim was talking about. Mark Kilroy, the young man with so much promise. From there, the plot only became more and more obscene. Seraphim was interrogated for hours, and what he told the police shocked them to say the least. This hadn't been a random kidnapping and murder, and Mark hadn't been abducted by any old gang or cartel. No, he'd been abducted by a voodoo cult. Seraphim and his fellow cultists were followers of Palo Mayombe, a violent religion that originated in Africa. They believed that by sacrificing Mark, they'd be blessed with luck, prosperity, and protection. As insane as it all sounded, the police humored him and asked him to go into detail about the sacrifice. According to Seraphim, the cult painted their bodies white and put on their ritual masks. Mark was tortured and sodomized for hours. Then, when they'd had their fun, they lopped off the top of Mark's head with a machete and boiled his brains in a pot. This brain stew was meant to win them favor with the gods. Surely the young thug was simply making up this ludicrous story to waste the cops' time. It was April Fool's after all. Well, that turned out not to be the case at all. When Seraphin led the police to the shack where Mark had been killed, they found the poor boy's brains in a makeshift cauldron, which the group had been using to create black magic potions. The rest of Mark Kilroy's body was discovered in a shallow grave not far from the scene of the sacrifice. His heart had been ripped out of his chest. 
Mark wasn't the cult's first victim. Far from it. As the police investigation continued, more and more bodies were unearthed in the area, all showing signs that they had been ritualistically sacrificed too. The shack with the cauldron also contained a number of blood-covered trinkets and souvenirs collected from the victims. At least 60 murders would later be linked to the group. It was obvious to the police that Seraphim was merely a follower of this depraved religion. He lacked the brains to be its leader. No, the cult's so-called High Priest was a man known as El Padrino, a longtime practitioner of black magic. As I'm sure you can imagine, he was also a heavy drug user. For years, El Padrino had been running his own business, an occult protection agency. Drug lords, gangsters, and businessmen alike would come to him, and in return for a huge amount of money, he would sacrifice an animal in their name. He claimed that this would bring them great fortune and protect them from evil spirits. Amazingly, business was booming. Soon, though, slaying animals was no longer enough. His more powerful magic required a different type of offering. A human life. Over time, his cult of killers grew larger and larger. They would capture innocent people, torture them, and then kill them in a variety of bloody ways. Some were even skinned alive. When El Padrino decided he needed more power, he knew only one particular type of offering would be sufficient. The blood of a gringo who had to die screaming. That's where Mark Kilroy came into the equation. It was simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When El Padrino and his goons saw Mark stumbling back towards the border, they took the chance to capture him and tied him up in the back of their truck. Knowing that his whole operation had been uncovered, El Padrino fled to Mexico City, where he laid low for two months. Police were able to track him down when, presumably high on drugs, he was seen throwing money out of his apartment window and shooting at anyone who tried to pick it up. The police were on the scene within minutes, knowing that they'd found the high priest they had been searching for. El Padrino was determined not to be taken alive though, and he and his goons made their last stand. A gunfight ensued that lasted for almost an hour. After the smoke had cleared, the police approached El Padrino, who was now lying on the floor. His body was riddled with bullets. Another gang member was also killed in the shootout, and five more were arrested. They were sentenced to 60 years apiece. And with that, the Mark Kilroy case finally came to a close. The truth behind his disappearance was almost stranger than fiction, but at long last, his friends and family finally had an answer, as well as some closure. Despite this, the Mexican police believed that El Padrino had a much larger following than just the small group that was captured. According to them, there could be as many as 90 more cultists still out there, abducting people from the streets of Mexico. Number 2 I've talked a lot about John and Jane Doe's in the past the bodies of missing people who nobody can seem to identify, the remains of those who died without a name. There are thousands of unidentified does in America alone, and sadly, a vast majority of them will remain unknown forever, the forgotten victims of disaster or murder. These often chilling recreations of what they may have looked like in life serve as a stark reminder that these unknown corpses were once people just like us, but at the same time, Without a name or any real pictures of them, they give them a ghost-like quality. This recently solved case revolves around one of these nameless few. In 1995, the body of a male known only as the Grateful Doe was discovered in Emporia, Virginia. He was given that name due to the Grateful Dead shirt he was wearing at the time of his death, and the fact that he had two stub tickets to a Grateful Dead concert in his pocket. The corpse was in the passenger seat of a wrecked car. Alongside him, in the driver's seat, was a man who was identified as Michael Hager. It appears as though he had fallen asleep at the wheel and crashed into two trees just off of US Route 58 West. 
there were no drugs or alcohol in either of their systems. Since neither of them were wearing seatbelts, they both died on impact. The Grateful Doe was between 15 and 21 years old when he died. He had a crude star tattoo on his left arm and a distinctive scar on his back. Despite severe lacerations to his face, reconstruction artists were able to produce this image of what he may have looked like in life. It was believed to be extremely accurate. With all of this information, it seemed likely that pretty soon, the family of a missing boy in the area would come forward and identify him, especially since he was with another of his friends at the time. Somebody out there must have known who he was. That turned out not to be the case. Absolutely no one could identify who the Grateful Doe was, not even Michael Hager's family. It appeared as though the two men didn't even know each other at all, despite the fact that they died in the same car. An analysis of his fingerprints turned up nothing, and despite tracking down the person who sold the Grateful Doe his concert tickets that night, the individual couldn't remember anything about him. In order to figure out who the Grateful Doe was, police turned to another piece of evidence. A handwritten note which was found near his body. It read as follows. Jason, sorry we had to go. See you around. Call me. Caroline T and Caroline O. Bye. Jason, a potential first name. Also on the note was a crude drawing of a man. It's now speculated that the drawing was of Jerry Garcia, frontman of the Grateful Dead, who actually died less than two months after this incident. But that's besides the point. What was significant was that these girls had clearly met the Doe at the concert that night. Despite their best efforts, the police were unable to find out who either of the Carolines were from the note. The number they left had no area code, and the note didn't lead to any other clues. This was all that the police had. The Doe liked the Grateful Dead, and his name was Jason. Or maybe it wasn't. Unfortunately, that was as far as their investigation took them. Over the course of the next 20 years, at least 221 missing people were ruled out as possible identities of the victim. It seemed like the Grateful Doe was destined to remain as just another unidentified body, lost to time. Then suddenly, a breakthrough. As we all now know, Reddit loves a good mystery. A subreddit had been set up on the site, dedicated to finding out the true identity of the Grateful Doe. Users would post the reconstructed images of the Doe, and discuss the case in depth. Over time, the subreddit slowly gained traction, drawing more and more attention to the case. Amazingly, in 2015, it also drew the attention of one of the Doe's old roommates. He immediately recognized the person from the reconstruction, and confirmed that his name was indeed Jason. This resulted in more of his friends and acquaintances hearing about the case, and coming forward with pictures of the young man. As you can see, this Jason bore an uncanny resemblance to the recreated photo. In one of these pictures, he's even wearing the same Grateful Dead shirt he was found in. According to his old roommates, he was known to have lived in both Illinois and South Carolina, though not in Virginia where the body was found. None of them had heard from Jason since about 1993, and most couldn't even recall his last name. That didn't matter now though. The police had everything they needed to prove the Grateful Doe's true identity. They were led to the Callahan household in South Carolina. There, Mrs. Callahan, Jason's mother, was able to confirm that her son had indeed been missing since 1995. She hadn't reported Jason as missing until 2015, since to her knowledge, he was living a nomadic lifestyle. You see, Jason had actually left home to follow the Grateful Dead on tour all those years ago, and his mother assumed he had decided to never return home. She was able to identify him in the photographs, and a DNA test proved conclusively that the Grateful Doe was indeed Jason Callahan. All the pieces of the puzzle had now fallen into place. The young man had simply hitchhiked on the night of his death, but had unfortunately got a ride with an extremely tired driver. He was only 19 years old when he died. At last, 20 years after that fateful crash, 
Jason Callahan's identity was restored to him, and he could now rest in peace. I've left a link to the subreddit that helps solve the Grateful Doe mystery. It's down in the description. Since the case has now been solved, the forum is now dedicated to investigating and raising awareness of all missing person cases. It's horrible to think of all the unidentified bodies that have been found over the years, and how, in many of these cases, their friends and family may still be waiting, hoping that one day their loved ones might just come walking through that door. Number 3 August 22nd, 1988, Japan A mysterious box appears on the Connor family doorstep. Inside is a pile of powdery ash and several human teeth. It's the remains of the couple's four-year-old daughter, Murray. Attached to the box is a note. It reads, Murray, cremated, bones. Investigate. Prove. This was the first killing committed by the otaku murderer, who would go on to take the lives of three more children over the course of ten months. To begin with, he was known as the Little Girl Killer, an elusive madman who would abduct his young victims, torment them, and then butcher them. Afterwards, he would indulge in vampirism by drinking their blood and eating parts of their severed hands. He often kept parts of their body in his home as souvenirs, and in one case, even kept one of his victims' entire body in his apartment. After committing his heinous crimes, he would relentlessly call up the parents of his victims. He never said a single word to them over the phone. He would just breathe heavily. If the bereaved family members didn't pick up the phone, he would simply continue to ring them endlessly until they did. He would also send them postcards. The parents of four-year-old Erica Namba received this chilling message. Erica. Cold. Cough. Throat. Rest. Death. These messages were assembled using words cut out of magazines. I don't want to go into any more details here about what this guy actually did, but there's plenty to read about online if you want to learn more about him. Needless to say, he was extremely messed up. His name was Sutomu Miyazaki. Ten months after murdering his first victim, he was caught in a park performing an act of sexual assault with the zoom lens on his camera. Yeah, you heard that right. He fled the scene completely naked, and was later apprehended by the police. Inside his apartment, they found the decaying remains of his final victim, hidden inside a closet. Alongside this, they found over 5,000 videotapes of anime and slasher movies, leading him to be dubbed the Otaku Murderer. This caused a media frenzy, and people quickly started to believe that these movies were the cause of his behaviour, that these anime and horror movies had turned him into a violent killer. In the West, some people actively self-identify as being otaku. In Japan, however, being labelled an otaku is nothing to be proud of and Tsutomu Miyazaki had a lot to do with the negative connotations associated with that word. He was a loner, a friendless outcast who spent his entire life obsessing over horror and anime. Some believe that this aspect of Tsutomu's life was played up in the media to secure a conviction, though this is of course just speculation. Tsutomu's own father refused to pay for his legal defence, and was so ashamed of his son's actions, that in 1994, he ended up killing himself. Tsutomu remained composed throughout the entire trial. Bizarrely, his defence rested on the fact that he hadn't committed these crimes consciously. Instead, they were the actions of his alter ego, Ratman. He drew cartoon images of this character, and said that Ratman forced him to commit murder. This, of course, didn't go down well with the judge. And in 1997, Tsutomu was sentenced to hang by the neck until dead. His sentence was carried out in 2008. As it stands, the otaku murderer remains one of the most infamous criminals in Japanese history, and the impact he left on the country's society can still be felt today.
Number 4 In 1992, a Russian man named Alexander Petushkin took up a new hobby, serial killing. He was inspired by the infamous murderer Andrei Chikatilo, another Russian who had mutilated and killed 52 people. But Petushkin was ambitious. He didn't just want to match his idol's death toll. No, he wanted to surpass him. Petushkin's goal was to kill 64 people, the same as the number of squares on a chessboard. As a result, he would later become known as the Chessboard Killer. He began indulging his bloodlust early in life. At the age of just 18, he killed one of his best friends. Though he was initially suspected of the murder, the police ended up dropping the charges due to a lack of evidence. Not long afterwards, he tossed a romantic rival out of a window to his death. The two men both had a crush on the same girl named Olga, but rather than compete with the other man for her affection, Petrushkin decided to take a more hands-on approach. This was only the beginning of his rampage. Police became aware of the chessboard murders when bodies began to be found in Bista Park, a massive, heavily wooded area filled with 60-foot-tall birch trees. Petrushkin would befriend people, mostly men, though occasionally women and children, and invite them to walk with him through the woods. His charm was infectious, and he was able to use his charisma to persuade them to join him. He would beguile them with interesting and philosophical conversation. Little did each of his victims know that he had said these carefully chosen words plenty of times before. Since his victims felt at ease in his company, it wasn't hard for the chessboard killer to lead them to particularly isolated areas, far from the public trail. In most cases, he would tell them that he buried one of his dogs in that exact spot. As his victims knelt down to say a small prayer with him, he'd beat them over the back of the head with either a hammer or a wrench. This angle reduced the amount of blood that splattered onto him. One hard strike was usually enough, though occasionally he'd have to batter them a few more times to finish the job. Sometimes he would take an empty bottle of vodka and insert it into the hole that he made in the back of his victim's skull. One of his female victims even had small metal stakes hammered into her brain. It's believed that this particular woman was Olga, the woman he had a crush on years before. In most cases, he wouldn't even try to hide the bodies. He would just leave them in plain sight on the trail. The chessboard killer was becoming cocky. Since there seemed to be no real pattern to how the killer selected his victims, the police were left stumped as to who was behind it all. This rampage continued for 14 long years, when finally, in 2006, Petrushkin made a fatal error. His final victim was his co-worker, a woman called Marina Moskalyova. He had arranged to take her out on a date. Afterwards, he lured her to Bista Park and slaughtered her, just like he had all the others. When he left her body, Petrushkin was unaware of what was inside her jacket pocket. A metro ticket from a station with CCTV, and a piece of paper with Petrushkin's phone number on it. When her body was discovered soon after, the police knew exactly who to pay a visit to. There was one piece of damning evidence that really sealed the Russian's fate though. Petrushkin kept a log, which he carried around in his pocket. Inside it, he had sketched out a chessboard with 64 squares. Every time he took the life of a victim, he would fill in a square with the date and time of their murder. By the time the police captured him, 61 squares had been filled in. Petrushkin was only three murders away from reaching his target when his rampage came to an end. But why would the chessboard killer keep such an incriminating item on his person? Well, for the same reason he liked to get to know his victims on the walk through the woods. He had a twisted idea of intimacy. At his own trial, Petrushkin said, The closer a person is to you, and the better you know them, the more pleasurable it is to kill them. In fact, a lot of information came out at the trial. As Petrushkin himself liked to say, he never lied. He seemed to be more than willing to admit to his crimes, and went into excruciating detail when describing each murder. 
he recounted the evening when he murdered Larissa Kulagina, a girl who he seduced into the woods. She must have known about all the other people who vanished in Bista, because as they came to a particularly secluded area of the forest, she fell to her knees and began to cry. She realized now that Petrushkin was the elusive serial murderer. Are you going to kill me? She asked. Being the honest man he was, Petrushkin simply replied, Yes. Despite not quite reaching his goal, Petrushkin took comfort in the fact that he outkilled Andre Chikatilo, and would now go down in history alongside his sadistic mass murdering hero. Only a handful of others could ever claim to have killed more than him. His three future victims, whoever they would have been, will never know how lucky they are. Petrushkin has been in solitary confinement for the past ten years. He'll never be released from prison. Recently, a woman known only as Natalia came to visit him, and the two of them ended up marrying. And yet, somehow, I'm still single. <sighs> <laughs> Number 5 I figured I'd end on a mystery that hasn't been conclusively solved yet, but where the answer has become tragically apparent. On the 24th of September 2016, Royal Air Force gunner Corey McKeague went on a night out with some friends in Suffolk, England. He and his pals got up to the usual things you'd expect from a group of 23-year-olds, namely drinking copious amounts of alcohol and dancing their cares away at a club. They ended up at a venue called Flex in Bury St. Edmunds. At around 1am, one of the nightclub doormen asked Corey to leave, since he was obviously far too drunk to stay. Corey complied, and went off on his merry way by himself, leaving his friends to enjoy the rest of their night. The group had no idea they would never see their friend again. You see, Corey never made it home that evening. Initially, this didn't raise many alarm bells. The young man had a reputation for going out and getting drunk, and then sleeping off the alcohol somewhere in town. When he failed to report for work on Monday the 26th, however, it became apparent that something was wrong. Corey was reported as missing to the police, and a large-scale manhunt began. His girlfriend, April Oliver, cut her trip to America short when she learned that her boyfriend had disappeared. Corey had no idea that April was pregnant with his child at the time he vanished, adding to the tragedy of his disappearance. As of right now, over a million pounds has been spent on trying to find Corey, and it's become one of the most expensive and publicised missing person cases conducted in Suffolk. Despite the widespread media attention that the case received, Corey still hasn't been found. Where did the young soldier vanish to that night, and why didn't he make it home that fateful evening? The police began by questioning the doorman at Flex, asking him about the state that Corey was in that night when he asked him to leave. According to him, Corey had been no trouble whatsoever, and the pair even chatted for a while on the street outside the club. He said that Corey stumbled off in the direction of a fast food outlet called Mamma Mia's. He could have easily ended up there. Reviewing the CCTV footage inside Mamma Mia's, it became clear that the doorman wasn't wrong. There, on the grainy monitor, was Corey. He'd been inside the takeaway joint between 1.15 and 1.30 a.m. This development prompted them to look at CCTV footage in and around the area. The camera showed Corey walking in a direction that didn't lead back to his home. Throughout the footage, the young man could be seen sleeping in various doorways. The last footage of him was taken at 3.25am, when he disappeared into a small nook full of wheelie bins. From there, the trail went cold. He simply never emerged from the area full of trash cans. The police checked his phone data, and discovered that after disappearing from view on the CCTV footage, Corey somehow travelled 12 miles northwest in only about 28 minutes. Obviously, that would have been an impossible journey to make on foot. He had to have been travelling in a vehicle. Had somebody offered Corey a lift off camera? If so, where had they taken him to? 
The data also showed that his phone was deactivated at around 8am, meaning that it was either switched off, ran out of battery, or was damaged. Whatever the case, it now became clear that wherever Corey was, he wasn't in Bury St. Edmunds anymore. All sorts of possibilities were explored. A local forest was thoroughly searched, in case Corey had been hit and killed in a road accident, and the panicked driver decided to hide his body. The police also looked into his use of swinger websites, thinking that perhaps another user had abducted him for some perverted purpose. At one point, a suitcase even appeared in the Suffolk area, containing a burned and dismembered corpse. DNA tests proved that this wasn't Corey, however. In reality, it appears as though Corey simply made a drunken decision that night, which, sadly, cost him his life. It came to light that on the morning of Corey's disappearance, a bin lorry collecting rubbish in the area was carrying 200 pounds more weight than predicted, the same amount as Corey weighed. In the words of his own mother, this can really, devastatingly, only mean one thing. As you may have suspected, Corey, in his drunken state, had fallen asleep in one of the bins. When the bin lorry came to collect all of the trash, the driver must not have realized that the young man was in amongst it all. The belief now is that he was tossed into the back of the truck and crushed to a pulp. The sight of the landfill that the lorry dumped its load at corresponded with the distance that Corey had traveled according to his phone data. Since this realization, over 7,000 tons of landfill waste has been sifted through. No trace of Corey has ever been found. It's possible that his remains were incinerated along with some other waste. The search for his body in the landfill site has since been called off. As of three days ago, Corey's been missing for exactly one year. Though fragments of his body are yet to be found, and the investigation is still technically ongoing, both the police and the McKeague family have accepted that Corey's remains are somewhere in the landfill site. Hopefully, this story serves as a reminder that even though alcohol might make us feel invincible, we are far, far from it. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please smash that like button, or I'll smash you. And let me know what sort of content you'd like to see coming up in the near future. Uh, up next, I've got a compilation video planned. That'll be out in a day or two. Just the best stories that I can collect from the past, however many months it's been since the last one. And that should be a nice couple of hours long, I reckon. Perfect for people who just like to listen namelessly to stories while they fall asleep. But after that, um, who knows? Could be anything, so make sure to leave your suggestions down below. Anyway, I won't drone on for much longer, if you can't tell I've got a bit of a cold. So, um, yeah, thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.